why are we here in the first place? Well, we want to make a lot of money. <laughs> so let's talk about our industry in general, um, why we're important, how cool we are, how much money we make. Computer chips, as you can imagine, are absolutely everywhere, and even in places that you don't imagine. So they are obviously in your computers, they're in your cell phones and your tablets, they're in gaming systems like Xbox and PlayStation 3 and Nintendo Wii and all these awesome things that uh, we absolutely can't live without. They are in your iPods, your DVD players, your televisions, they're in watches. Sometimes watches that even have uh, the dial on them ha still have a computer chip inside. They're in your cars. Modern luxury automobiles actually can have over 200 computer chips in them, which I found astounding when I learned that myself. Uh, they are in pacemakers and coffee pots, which is my version of a pacemaker. But pacemakers are um, also something that's kind of near and dear to my heart, um, I guess pun, pun intended. When my brother was in his early 20s, he had a super irregular heartbeat for no reason. He was athletic, healthy, strong, nothing wrong with him. But his heart rate would spike and then at night sometimes it would drop to 20 beats per minute, which is extremely low. And so the doctors recommended that he get a pacemaker. Well, the amazing thing about this pacemaker that they gave him was the computer chip inside um, could control his heart rate simply by taking a flat paddle and they put it on against his chest and it was connected to a keyboard and you could program that pacemaker from the outside world just by the keyboard. And so um, I went to visit my brother in the hospital and he's lying there recovering from you know, heart surgery. And I'm like, wow, look how cool this is. You know, you put this paddle on your chest, you know, hey, a uh, little sibling rivalry maybe? How about 120 beats per minute, man? No, I didn't really do that. But I'm still fascinated by this technology that can save lives and actually record all of the heart data in that computer chip so that uh, people who have pacemakers now simply connect their telephone, you know, just put their telephone up there and send the data over to their doctor so their cardiologist can say, hmm, looks like your pacemaker's working really well or we need to make some adjustments, come on in. So it's absolutely fascinating what these things can do. And sort of a follow-on to my brother's story was interesting. The battery in his first pacemaker was designed to last five years and then after five years he would need to go in and they would put a new battery or a new pacemaker in. And so when five years was up, he went in and said, they said, okay, we've got this great new pacemaker for you. The battery lasts 10 years. He said, I don't want it. And they looked at him like, why, are you nuts? He said, no, no, I want one that only has five years because I want the latest technology in five years. I don't want to wait 10 years for something because I'm going to have this obsolete device. Um, and so, so I guess he's fueling Moore's Law or whatever, but the idea that each generation is going to get better and better and better was give me the latest and greatest. I don't want a long lasting battery, which is the opposite of what we want in our iPod or our tablet or our computer. We want that battery to last forever. So uh, our industry is pulled in a lot of different directions at the same time. Uh, computer chips obviously are in satellites, they're in greeting cards, you know, the ones that play music. There's like an entire computer in that card and you go, hmm, happy birthday to me, and then you stick it in a drawer. Have some respect the next time you get one of those cards for all the hard work that goes into the chip that's inside that card. Uh, what's fascinating too is the internet itself is built on semiconductors, on computer chips. So when you next time go and Google or look at a YouTube video like this, imagine that inside the internet, way down in there are all the little computer chips and we help design those kinds of things. Uh, it's, it's really, yeah, have some respect. <laughs> um, how big is the semiconductor industry? How many chips do we sell each year? Approximately, we're almost up to $300 billion, which is really neat because um, over the last, uh, I don't know, I, I, I say handful of years, we, we, the semiconductor industry, went way down. We had a terrible slump, along with um, most industries in the world. But I was delighted to update this and say we're almost back to where we were several years ago. So about $300 billion, and this number, by the way, is from 2010, um, because the 2011 data hasn't been published yet, and this is January of 2012. So uh, next time you, that you see this video, maybe we'll update it with a little higher number. That's the goal. The EDA industry, the, the, the kinds of things that my company does for a living, we're about $5.3 billion. And um, it's really interesting because none of these computer chips would exist without 
the electronic design automation industry. So we have what we call market drivers, and these are the things that um, drive us to behave the way we are, which is kind of crazy. The first one is called time to market. You have to get your products out to the market in time, and that is fast. So let me tell you a story. So years ago, when my son was little, okay, he's big now, but he was little, he looked at me and he says, Mom, if I don't get Nintendo 64 for Christmas, I am going to die. <laughs> so I said, oh my gosh. So being the good mom I am, I'm, I run out to Target and I'm going to buy Nintendo 64. Well, guess what? Nintendo missed the time to market window. They didn't get enough product on the shelves in time for Christmas. Shelves are empty. And so what a lot of parents did is they looked to the side and said, ooh, Sony PlayStation. I think I'll buy that for my, for my son. And so Nintendo lost a lot of business that year because they missed time to market. So years go by, my son grows, and uh, the Game Boy comes out. Mom, I really want a Game Boy for Christmas. Okay, so this time I'm going to do it right. I get up to Best Buy, and there's a big sign on the door. It says, don't even ask about Game Boys. So guess what? Nintendo did it again. They missed that time to market window, and they lost a ton of business. So of course, I had to wait until his birthday and get him the prizes that he wanted, and he's happy, living happily ever after, obviously. But uh, this whole time to market thing is, we have got to get those products out there in time. And when a company like Nintendo designs computer chips that goes into their, um, into their Wiis or their Game Boys, those chips are designed with electronic design automation. And so that's why we have to hurry up, hurry up, and that time to market pressure is very important to us as well. Another critical aspect that drives our market is global competition. We in the United States used to be the semiconductor industry or the chip industry. It always here in the United States. And we became maybe a little bit complacent. And the Japanese said, you know what, we can invent, we can produce those, those computer chips cheaper, faster, higher quality, and they really decimated the uh, United States market for a while. So the U.S. woke up and said, whoa, we don't want to lose the semiconductor market. So there, there were a lot of steps that were put in place. But that was sort of the first step outside the United States into a global market, and now semiconductors are manufactured all over the world, primarily in Taiwan, which is very interesting. Now, another aspect of global competition that people don't usually think about is we, when we work internationally, and a company like ours has offices all around the world in practically every company, uh, country that you can imagine, we need to understand things like the government regulations of each country, the culture of the people, their, probably their religious views, their, um, their practices, their taboo kinds of behaviors, and even their body language. So when I uh, was working at Texas Instruments, like I said, my first job, we were setting up an operation in Bangalore, India, because there were a lot of young Indian engineers, very, very smart, and they would work for a lot less money than a United States engineer would work for. And we wanted to start building a more global economy. So we started up an operation in Bangalore, and the young engineers came over to the United States, and we would train them for six months, and then they would go back home and continue to work for TI. So I had a young engineer in my group. and. What I, and this is, this is kind of a funny story. If you're an Indian, you're going to laugh your head off at this. Uh, so he's sitting next to me, and I was explaining to him, this is how, you know, stuff works. And he shook his head. Well, and keep in mind, he spoke perfect English, so we didn't have a language barrier, but he shook his head. And I thought, oh, darn, I didn't explain it very well. So I reworded everything, explained it in a different way, and he shook his head again. And I thought, uh-oh, this is getting kind of scary because, you know, he's working with me and, and I need to get him to understand what we do. So I, I, did, I did refrain from doing the thing that people do when they aren't communicating very well. I did not raise my voice and yell because that saying it louder was not going to help. But I tried a third time, and he shook his head like crazy. And finally I said, why don't you understand what I'm saying? And he said, why do you keep repeating yourself? And I said, well, wait a minute. I say something and you shake your head. And that means no. He said, oh, absolutely not. He said, 
in India, when we shake our head, that means I understand what you're talking about. Sure, that makes perfect sense. So this slight, tiny little body language had been this barrier to communication between us. And had I not learned this, um, we could never have communicated. So global competition is a lot more than money and resources. It has to do with things even as small as body language. And so I encourage all of you to learn something special about another culture. Even if you don't get a chance to take a trip, learn things like in the Middle East, it's a terrible thing to show the bottom of your shoe. If you cross your leg and show the bottom of your shoe, that's a terrible insult. And if you know these things before you meet people from other countries, then you can make friends with them and uh, uh, dare I say, maybe we can bring a little more peace on earth. Anyhow, let's get back to business. Um, one of the things that drives us so much in our industry is lower costs. Because if you remember the original cell phone, $1,000, now you can get a cell phone for free and it does about a million things more than it used to. So everything has to cost less, 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 less. And that's what drives the electronic design industry to figure out how can we do this next chip that's even more complicated cheaper. So the things that are driving us, everything gets smaller and smaller and smaller. It gets faster and faster and faster and there's more stuff packed into it um, than you can imagine. So our industry is dynamic, it's challenging, and it's very exciting to be a part of. The goal that we have, again, I think I mentioned this in a previous video, is that we need to help increase productivity 10 times every six years, keeping with Moore's Law so that we can keep up with the demand all around the world for awesome electronic products.